Thank you very much, Chancellor John Woods, for those kind words. Uh, members of the University of Canterbury community and the IPENS uh, Canterbury branch, members of the Hopkins family who are present, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to the University and IPENS for inviting me to come and give this annual lecture. Uh, certainly a privilege to be introduced by John Woods, as I worked very closely with John over many years as Prime Minister, and he was well known to me as one of New Zealand's finest diplomats and public servants long before I became a Prime Minister. And giving this lecture also reminds me that the last time I gave a public address in Christchurch was two years ago, because I came at the invitation of Cathedral Dean Peter Beck to speak in Christchurch Cathedral. And uh, so much has happened to that beautiful building as to this uh, beautiful city uh, since that time, and uh, I'll reflect on that as I make my comments uh, tonight as, as well. But uh, I understand that the lecture was set up uh, to recognise the many years of distinguished service of Professor Hopkins in the field of engineering, a man uh, known for vision, dedication and extraordinary talents in his uh, profession and that the professor himself gave the inaugural lecture titled, in 1978, A Land of Bridges, A Story of New Zealand. So I hope 34 years on that the core message of my address, which in a way is resilience, is development, and is about act now, save later, as you saw in the short video, uh, and also focus in figurative ways about the need to build bridges, to link between uh, the experiences of this city, the experiences of building resilience in New Zealand, and with the needs of other countries who are also trying to build resilience and recover, as Christchurch is trying to recover from extremely traumatic uh, disasters. There's another sense in which uh, bridges need to be built in this area as well, and it's between emergency relief, recovery, and longer-term development. And one of the things uh, which does uh, bedevil us uh, is that so often that ambulance is parked firmly at the bottom of the cliff. And time and time again, people go over uh, that cliff with major disaster because the basic resilience wasn't able to be uh, met. I'm very mindful of the nine years I spent as Prime Minister where you started to see over time that more and more of the New Zealand Official Development Assistance budget needed to go into responding to complex emergencies. The Boxing Day tsunami was obviously the, one of the monties of, of complex uh, emergencies, but increasingly our money was, was uh, needing to go more in that direction. And there's now been quite a major reflection among the international donor community, Western countries like our own, which is leading them to see that more of the money now tagged for humanitarian relief uh, has to be uh, tagged for building resilience so that you do start to put the, cliff at the, the fence at the top of the cliff rather than have uh, people fall over each time there's a, a major disaster. And the big agencies like USAID, uh, the European Commission's uh, humanitarian aid budget, and the British aid budget are now specifically starting to earmark 10 to 15 per cent of the humanitarian relief budget for resilience building, which is a positive uh, trend. So, building resilience, uh, building preparedness, recovering from disaster, planning for these things is very much a core function of the UN Development Programme, and I'll talk a little about that as I go along. Uh, we work in uh, every uh, developing country and territory on uh, Earth, uh, around 177 in total. Many of them have experienced or can expect to experience uh, disasters. Uh, now, in my job, I also get to visit communities which have experience terrible disaster. And by the way, I'm so pleased I was able to come to Christchurch just very shortly after the tragedy which struck here at a time when it was so important to show solidarity and support. 
I went to Haiti four days after uh, the quake there in January 2010. I'll say a little more about that too. I went to Pakistan. Actually, I was in Pakistan when news of the earthquake in February 2011 uh, in Christchurch came through. And I was there to look at the aftermath of the terrible flooding, which covered quite a significant proportion of the country uh, from uh, the August-September period of 2010. And how distressing six months later to see that water still hanging around and the recovery job uh, still uh, not able to be completed. And then just uh, earlier this year, I went to the landlocked Sahel country of Niger uh, in uh, West Africa with Valerie Amos, who heads the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And we went to uh, see for ourselves and advocate for uh, more effective responses to the very, very significant drought, which is affecting the whole Sahel uh, region this year. And again, one is so struck by the contrast uh, between communities which had had some support to build greater resilience, large water reservoir, proper well, uh, transfer of skills from pastoralism, which struggles in these increasingly erratic climates, to vegetable growing backed by irrigation from the conserved water. Villages like that don't look too bad, even in the middle of a great drought, but drive 15 minutes and you see the very, very distressing sights of the little children with limbs so thin you feel they would snap like a matchstick, and the very young and distraught mothers who are having to walk for several hours to come to feeding centres for their children. So building resilience is, is very much on, on my mind as a priority for our work. Now, let's just look at some of the uh, factual background around the disaster risk uh, that our world faces. Uh, you saw in the video, it's estimated that uh, perhaps 2 billion people, even some say 4.4 billion people, cumulatively may have been affected by disasters caused by natural hazards in the last two decades. Certainly in the last 20 years, it's estimated about 1.3 million people have been killed from these hazards. 2011 alone, Almost 30,000 people killed in 302 recorded disasters and 206 million people affected. Last year that included 106 million affected by flooding and 60 million by drought, mainly in the Horn of Africa last year. So the cost in human life and lives upset and destroyed is high. Then if you look at the economic costs, uh, over the last two decades, economic costs from uh, natural hazard disasters are estimated at more than US $2 trillion. I don't know whether you like me and start to think, how many noughts do I put on the end of that? It's such a staggering uh, figure. And last year, uh, earthquakes and violent weather-related catastrophes uh, made 2011 the costliest year ever for response and recovery from disaster. And again, the Canterbury experience has been, this has been an extraordinarily expensive event, not only by New Zealand standards, uh, but actually by uh, world uh, standards. Uh, so the global economic losses attributed to these disasters from natural hazards last year reached $380 billion, <laughs> an increase of nearly two thirds over the previous uh, record year, which was 2005. So, second point to register. Disaster risk is rising. Climate variability and change, combined with larger populations who are living in areas exposed to risk, whether from erratic climate or seismic risk, other factors too are driving a rapid overall rise in disaster risk for all kinds of countries, whether they're rich or poor, developed or uh, developing. And uh, as we know from what happened here in Christchurch, uh, from what happened in the Great East Japan earthquake and all of the flow on effects from that tsunami, uh, nuclear meltdown, uh, even when we have gone to tremendous efforts to be well prepared, we are not immune 
uh, to the destructive forces of nature. But we also know that much can be done and has already been done in many places to reduce that impact. And Japan and New Zealand are exactly examples of countries which have demonstrated over long periods of time that making investments in prevention and preparedness, including through civil defence exercising, is a very necessary part of systematic efforts to build a resilience. You know, I think back over my years in public life, uh, before we had the old parliamentary debating chamber renovated, we were at huge earthquake risk. And we were told that if there was a major uh, shake in Wellington, what could happen to the old debating chamber was that the walls would go out and the roof would fall in. And I remember the earthquake drills when a siren would go off and we would be told to get under the desks. <laughs> not everyone fitted under the desks very <laughs> neatly. But is it not true that about the only steel in the old building was in the drain pipes? So when you go on the tour of Parliament now and see that incredible system where our building is on rollers, it is just uh, such a, a huge advance in, in safety. Uh, the loss of life and property here in Christchurch has been uh, devastating, and I hope it is rather more than cold comfort to say how much worse it would have been if the investments and resilience hadn't been made uh, in the past. That earthquake in Haiti in January 2010 was around the same magnitude as the major February 2011 quake in Christchurch. Now, what happened in Haiti was an estimated 220,000 plus people were killed. And it's clear that it is not the magnitude of the disaster or the natural hazard alone which determines the impact that it will have on humans and their communities. The truth is that many countries have not been able to invest or are not investing enough in prevention and preparedness. And among those who fund development, not yet enough support is going into this vital work of preparedness. And the result is another stark reality of our times that striking inequalities persist. Striking inequalities characterise global disaster risk. The risk is disproportionately concentrated in poorer countries with weaker systems of governance and capacities. So, 95% of all disaster-related deaths occur in developing countries. Overall, the risk of being killed by a cyclone or a flood is lower today than it was 20 years ago, but the poorest countries are still the most vulnerable. Under 2% of global deaths from cyclones occur in countries with high levels of development, while more than half of the deaths occur in the least developed countries, the poorest uh, group of countries on, on Earth. Now, according to the World Bank estimates, around 2.5 billion people on our planet live on under New Zealand $2.50 a day. As we know, again from experience here in this city, a natural disaster is devastating for people who live in a developed country. For those who live at or below the internationally established poverty lines, the $1.25 uh, US a day, and then there's the $2 mark as well, the consequences are particularly dire as disasters disrupt the whole long-term progress of development and prevent people escaping from poverty. In fact, they throw people back into poverty, particularly noticeable in communities which are repeatedly affected by drought, where many are forced to sell their assets and are really taken to the barest uh, subsistence level uh, as a result. Now, when I was in Niger in February, a woman representative of the small peasant farmer organisations uh, told me that what happens in a very severe drought in her country is that when the money runs out, uh, the men leave home and they go to find work. Now, in the past, they used to be able to go to Libya in great numbers. That's not so easy anymore. Uh, Mali, next door to Niger now, is, has a, a, a raging conflict in its north in secession. 
People used to go down to Ivory Coast, but it's very unsettled. Uh, maybe they tried to go to Nigeria, to the east, but Ni north of Nigeria is experiencing turbulent times. So it's not so easy just for the men to go and find work, but they go. And you know, sometimes they're not heard of for quite a long time and may not be able to bring much money back. And so the women and children, uh, they start to sell what they have, which could be their tools, whatever furniture, any little bit of jewellery that they might have, and, and then you, you're thrown onto, onto charity. And in the case of Niger, in this Western Sahel region, this 2012 drought comes two years after the last devastating drought, so people have not been able to build up their supplies before. So building resilience to this in countries like Niger is just so, so critical. And it's for all these kinds of reasons that disaster risk reduction is a huge priority uh, in development. Resilience uh, is development. Without resilience, poor countries, poor communities, poor families just get knocked flat uh, time after time after time. Now, the United Nations has been very active, not only through our own development program, but also at the global policy level on disaster risk reduction. Uh, it, uh, has uh, uh, accepted definition, the concept and practice of reducing disaster risks through systematic efforts to analyze and manage the causal factors of disasters, including through reduced exposure to hazards, lessened vulnerability of people and property, wise management of land and the environment, hence our little video, and improved preparedness for adverse events. Now that definition of disaster risk reduction directs us to address the drivers of risk, uh, such as uncontrolled urbanisation and earthquake prone areas, indiscriminate tree cutting, uh, settlements on floodplains, uh, etc. And it also guides us to prepare for the consequences of the disaster and work to see that the institutions and the capacities are in place to provide uh, proper, proper services. Now, back in 2005, the UN General Assembly uh, established a process which led to what is called the HIOGO Framework for Action for the Decade from 2005. HIOGO is a Japanese uh, city. Uh, the uh, framework was decided on there. It's been endorsed by uh, most of the world's country and it guides international policy on the uh, reduction of uh, disaster risk. Uh, it sets out uh, priorities around ensuring that disaster risk reduction is a national and a local priority with a strong institutional basis for implementation of what has to be done. And New Zealand provides a model of this. We have our institutions, we have our systems, we have a great deal to share. Uh, the other priorities, uh, capacity to identify, assess and monitor disaster risks and enhance the early warning systems. Use knowledge, innovation and education to build a culture of safety and resilience at all levels. Reduce the underlying risk factors and strengthen preparedness for effective uh, response. Uh, we have then this international strategy for disaster reduction. There is a secretariat for it. Uh, the, for the uh, international strategy. And I was uh, very pleased to see that uh, my old colleague, Leanne Dalziel, who's here tonight, was appointed to a parliamentary network, which that uh, independent UN office uh, operates uh, around uh, disaster reduction. But UNDP comes in as a very significant player uh, because it is one of the world's largest development agencies and specifically in its mandate is to work on crisis prevention and recovery. That takes two forms. One is the form of trying to prevent the sort of crisis that comes from war and conflict and lack of social cohesion and breakdown of relations uh, between and within countries. But the other aspect of it is exactly to work in this prevention uh, of crisis from disaster and recovery from it. And you know, I go back to my analogy about the importance of building the fence at the top of the cliff. Indeed, we have defined our mission a state statement in a little tagline that says, empowered lives, resilient nations. 
empowered people can build resilient nations, and investing in disaster risk reduction is an essential component of that. So, let me then go through uh, four key messages that I would like to leave from tonight. Firstly, investing in disaster risk reduction is cost effective and it is smart development for any country. Recent work done by UN agencies and by the World Bank shows that while specific cases may vary, for every dollar put into minimising disaster risk, about $7 will be saved from economic losses from disasters. Uh, the United Kingdom's International Aid uh, Department has done some work on how much building resilience to drought could save Ethiopia. They estimate $3.3 billion over 20 years. And in Kenya, savings over the same period are estimated at nearly $21 billion. Then investments in minimising seismic disaster risk also not only save lives, as again we saw in this city, but also make good economic sense. I'm told that it costs less than an additional 10% to build a new home to be earthquake resistant. But to retrofit an existing home, I'm given a figure that it could cost up to 50% percent of the total initial building cost to go back and do the job again. So do it first has to be the message. Now, as I said earlier, the global investment in disaster risk reduction really remains rather low. Uh, we have looked at the range of figures across developing countries. They go from a very low level of naught point naught naught five of national budget in Lesotho allocated for disaster risk reduction purposes to just over two and a half percent in Sri Lanka. There's very, very little invested in some of the poorest uh, countries. And of the official development assistance going to the world's 40 poorest countries, one percent of it went to disaster risk reduction. I think that thinking is starting to change. There is a greater appreciation of the need for resilience because of the sheer cost of responding to complex emergencies. And in my time uh, at, at the UN, I've seen the response to Haiti, $9 billion pledged for the recovery and response in Haiti. Uh, Pakistan floods huge, Sahel droughts huge, uh, Cyclones in the Philippines, huge. Horn of Africa drought, huge. Huge sums of money. So the concept of investing early in resilience is getting a lot of traction. Now, a UN report last year on the Asia-Pacific region noted that the risk of mortality, that's of death, from tropical cyclones and floods has dropped by around two-thirds in the region since the 1980s, which is, of course, good news. But while more lives are being saved, there's less progress on saving people's livelihoods. The number of people who are affected by these disasters and the cost of the damage of disasters are going up. And returning back to some kind of normalcy takes time because of the size of the impact and cost. Again, Christchurch knows so much about that. The floods in Thailand last year cost the country more than $45.7 billion, which was nearly 14% of its GDP. And the ricochet effects of that went far beyond Thailand. Japan has quite a lot of offshore manufacturing uh, in the areas struck by the, the Thai floods that affected the Japan uh, economy too. Recovery in Haiti, uh, more than two years following the quake, there's still around 400,000 people in uh, the camps huge number of people. So in investing in resilience, we have in mind that we're trying to avert situations which will throw very large uh, numbers of people and economies into reverse uh, gear when disaster strikes. And in the case of the poorest countries, uh, sometimes you will get setbacks in development which you can never make up for people. 
if children are pulled out of school, they may never get back again. Uh, the spread of disease can cause further death and distress, like cholera in Haiti. There were half a million cases of cholera in Haiti last year, with a population of something like uh, 10 uh, million. Uh, very, very sobering. In the area of growing risk, I come back to what is happening to our climate. Uh, the average temperature of the globe has already increased by 0.8 uh, degrees centigrade since records began to be taken over 130 years ago. Uh, we're told that if we go over the two degree level of rise, we face irreversible and catastrophic change in our climate, increased disaster risk. Uh, sensible people are now talking of how difficult it will be to keep the temperature rise below three to four percent, and I'm even hearing some people, including Al Gore, talk about six to seven percent rises. So if two percent, if two degrees uh, was bad, what is six to seven? going to be, uh, to be like. Um, so we have these factors. We also have uh, the way development has occurred uh, putting uh, things more at risk. For example, in a lot of countries, the way and the location in which physical infrastructure has been built has been done without regard uh, to possible uh, risk. I guess we could think Fukushima when we say that but also infrastructure that is exposed to flooding and, and other hazards as, as well. And in the case of those devastating floods in Thailand last year, some of the experts have argued that when the area was developed, uh, including for industrial purposes, they didn't sufficiently consider natural drainage uh, patterns, including the role of wetlands, and so this exacerbated the flood risk and increased the damage uh, from the flooding. You have uh, around the cities of the developing world the growth of these huge informal uh, settlements and many very unstable living environments. Now one of the most devastating things about Port-au-Prince and Haiti is you're looking at a, a city which rises from a coastal narrow strip straight up very, very steep hillsides. And on these hillsides are very steep ravines. And the poor come in from the countryside where there's very little opportunity, and they build their shacks down the ravines. Now, if you're at the bottom of the ravine, the heavy rain season goes through your house pretty regularly, year by year. But what happened with the quake was everything kind of cascaded down. It was like the, the favelas, the slum neighbourhoods sort of sunk down the ravine. People get crushed, killed to death. And clearing up out of there is a huge task. When I was there in March, we were still uh, supporting countries with work schemes uh, to try and get the debris up out of these gullies because realistically people are going to rebuild there. Uh, but you have to try and uh, clear in some way first. And then we're also working on building back uh, better uh, which is a, a, a longer story. There's also uh, the factor of some of the choices around development which have been made, such as promoting uh, the growing of very water intensive cash crops in countries which are in regions which are basically semi arid. Now, you know, in a good year, that may boost local economies, but if that kind of growing depends so heavily on canal irrigation, that even a slight variation in rainfall will throw it out, uh, then you can end up with an co economy that is really very, very much at risk, production that's very, very uh, much at risk, and you know, on reflection may not have been the best way uh, to boost uh, an economy. So let's come to some of the examples of how UNDP has been supporting disaster uh, risk Production and I'll sort of give examples across the, the, the flooding kind of disaster and the uh, seismic risk disaster. Right at this time, we're working in uh, over 60 countries precisely on disaster risk reduction. So what do we emphasise? We emphasise that the natural hazards 
have to be addressed in ways which will reduce the vulnerability of people and will reduce the economic and social impact. We absolutely stress that what is done has to be nationally and locally owned. The leadership has to come from the country and from the people. We can build in uh, the international support, share the best practice, but there has to be national ownership and leadership uh, of this. It cannot be led from outside. We stress that the approaches have to be comprehensive, uh, touching uh, all sectors of society and involving whole of uh, government approaches, as we know uh, from New Zealand. We stress a commitment to innovation, learning, best practice, learn from what worked, what didn't work, share experiences. And in fact, just in the last three weeks or so, I've had um, my most senior manager at UNDP, an assistant secretary general, actually come to Christchurch and also make calls in Wellington and just see what he, as our leader in this area, could pick up from the experience uh, that Christchurch has had. Uh, the final point I want to stress about what we emphasise is this is long-term work. It's not flash in the pan. You do not build resilience overnight. It needs sustained engagement from donors, development agencies, the national uh, actors. It is not quick. And sometimes you get, get things going and another disaster is on top of you before you've even got much traction. I'll give Niger as another example of that. The 2010 drought was so tough uh, that I was inspired by the previous uh, UN Emergency Relief Coordinator, Sir John Holmes, who said, when is somebody going to address the underlying factors? And I got my Africa Bureau and crisis prevention people and I said, for God's sake, what are we doing to help address the underlying factors? And we had, uh, by happy uh, coincidence or timing, just developed what we call the Millennium Development Goal Acceleration Framework Approach to focus on areas of development which were really lagging and work on ways of getting all stakeholders in a country and the development uh, actors and supporters and donors to work out what is standing in the way of actually achieving these goals. And so for Niger, uh, I wrote to the president, met the president, and I said, would you work with us to accelerate progress on the Millennium Development Goal 1, which is on reducing food insecurity and reducing hunger? And that, of course, means addressing drought-prone uh, countries. So uh, he readily agreed. We got a very good process going. We got an action plan out of it, everyone behind it. Niger, which is so poor, put in 30 million of its own money over five years and you know, starting to work. Some of the things we had to do were not uh, actually directly related to agriculture as such at all. There were things like if you don't have any security of tenure over the land that you're trying to farm, you don't invest in it. You don't put the investment into the irrigation, the reservoir, uh, the well, etc. So one of the things that came out was a big process of issuing land titles. And of course it's important that women also get a chance to get their name on a title. In many countries women do the work but they never get to own the land. If you can't own the land or you don't have the leasehold right, you can't get the, the credit to do anything. So all these complicated issues. Uh, we did, as part of this action plan, get uh, a better early warning system about drought set up. And that is why, in the case of this terrible drought this year, the Niger government was able to tell the world in August last year that there was going to be an extremely serious drought because the rains had not come and they could measure and monitor that. Now, you know, we're still going on this medium longer term approach, but meantime the drought strikes, half the people of the country would not be alive today if the international community wasn't putting in the money uh, to feed people, but we know what the long term answer is and the Niger government itself, adding to the action plan, now has this three ends strategy, driven by the president, uh, and three ends is about Nigerians nurturing Nigerians. You know, we must feed ourselves, we must feed our people, and uh, they're trying to devise a food system. And in that food system, they are looking at what, uh, what is the basis of food security 
for the family. What do they need? What does the village need? What does the market town need to try and get a functioning food system? So very, very important long-term work and all part of, of uh, building resilience. So uh, Bangladesh is a country which has significantly reduced disaster risk over time. 1991, a terrible cyclone in Bangladesh. 140,000 people were killed. Uh, a cyclone of around the same magnitude hit in 2007. 4,000 people died. Now, what had happened in between? Well, a lot of people had been very busy. Uh, and UNDP was one of the partners which was very busy with the government. So there was support to design better risk reduction policies, train people, implement measures which would protect livelihoods, build small embankments to protect agriculture, steps to improve the emergency warning systems, uh, development partners helped support uh, better infrastructure, including cyclone shelters for people to go to, the civil society organisations, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movements, everyone pulled in to get Bangladesh's disaster risk reduction capacities uh, up. Now, about close to two years ago, I went to an island in Bangladesh which was right out on the edge of the Bay of Bengal. And in the terrible cyclone of 1991, I understand that virtually everyone on that island was killed. Uh, the waters just came through. Now, you know, Bangladesh has a lot of people and not a lot of land, so people keep going back to devastated places. And you work to see what can you do which would build their resilience to disaster. And one of the things that we've been very involved in uh, is uh, the reforestation of mangroves, because the mangroves are a buffer against the cyclones and the tidal surges. And there's been uh, quite a lot of, of work done and opportunity created uh, uh, through that. So in Bangladesh, we can absolutely show that investments in resilience over a period of time are saving lives and saving uh, livelihoods. Mozambique's another example. In 2000, it was badly battered by cyclones and floods. 800 people dead, half a million people out of their homes and more than a million uh, lost their income. Again, fast forward seven years, a similar sized cyclone hit the country. The death toll and the displacement from the flooders, flooding significantly lower, 29 people as opposed to 800 and 70,000 displaced, not half a million. Uh, so what was done? Well, again, the government the communities, the development actors, including ourselves, got busy. Established a National Disaster Management Institute, which hadn't been there before. It coordinates the disaster risk reduction measures. It developed a nat nationwide master plan for this, which was adopted. Standardised procedures were developed for preparing communities for storms, cyclones, floods. Communities were trained on how you monitored the water levels, how you communicated with the relevant authorities uh, when there were rising water levels, how you disseminated evacuation warnings, all these things work and they save lives. Then come to Indonesia, uh, ranked second in the world for extreme natural hazard risk. Uh, ocean, Indian Ocean tsunami, uh, we're all familiar with, the tragedy of Boxing Day 2004 claimed over 126,000 lives in Indonesia, $4.45 billion worth of damage. After that, the government made major policy changes to address disaster risk. We were involved with the Safer Communities for Disaster Risk Reduction Program. The involvement of communities is so critical. Uh, we've supported Indonesia to write disaster risk reduction into the National Five-Year Development Plan, which means that these preparedness activities are prioritised now in the budget. Uh, a tremendous amount has been done. Now, January this year, a 7.6 magnitude earthquake hit Aceh province. There was very little damage, no lives were lost. 
and the community response systems worked. The tsunami warnings by the Aceh government went out on time and people managed to evacuate. So it does work. Now, let me come just to reflect a little on what we can learn from here in uh, Christchurch and how New Zealand helps the world in, in dealing with disaster risk uh, reduction. Firstly, I want to repeat, I think New Zealand has a lot to be proud of for the investments it's made over a very long period of time in general disaster preparedness and response. In Christchurch, we saw the emergency services, police, fire, ambulance, armed services coming in, civil defence authorities, local communities, community organisations, service groups, you know, just everybody pulled together. And of course, the international support is greatly uh, appreciated. Uh, and the investments in preparedness over all those years with the building codes and so on did so much to save people's lives. We have a very extensive civil defence system in our country and our Earthquake Commission, which was always the Earthquake and War Damages Commission when I was growing up, is probably unique in the world. Those who set it up had tremendous foresight as without it, we would not be able to have so much of the cost of the disasters we experience covered by insurance. So we would be knocked flat like the people I see knocked in developing countries, uh, knocked flat. Now, of course, a num so many people have been knocked flat in Christchurch, and it's a long and slow and frustrating process. I fully appreciate it. Um, Successive governments here have invested in prevention and better understanding of the risk that is posed by natural hazards. I seem to recall in my time in government, Michael Cullen ensuring there was funding for seismic detection and analytical equipment. Some of it, I understand, was used here in Canterbury. And investments like this help put New Zealand in the forefront of knowledge in this kind of area. We have so much to contribute through knowledge and innovation. Many developing countries increasingly do not ask for, do not want humanitarian support for disasters. They cope with that themselves. What they want is information and the best technical advice and support and experience shared on how to prevent the worst happening. Out of New Zealand have come innovative technologies like the use of the lead rubber bearing to buffer building foundations from earthquakes. All that expertise in earthquake engineering, volcanology, tsunami warning systems, which has been taken by our people around the world, uh, including, for example, volcano, volcano lahar warning systems to Jogjakarta, uh, Indonesia. And then there's all that specialist earthquake engineering assistance that's gone out to India, Iran, Nepal, the Philippines, Romania, Taiwan, Turkey, the Emirates, to name just a few. You know, when I was uh, Prime Minister, one of the things we were almost most proud to showcase when uh, a, a leader from a country which was prone to seismic risk came to New Zealand was our cluster of engineering industries which, and professionals who worked in this area. I think I remember David Hopkins himself and others uh, like him uh, being part of the presentation to the Prime Minister of Turkey when he came a number of years ago. But it, it's really something where we have world leading expertise. And I remember meeting uh, David Hopkins and other uh, Kiwi engineers working on a World Bank funded project in Istanbul uh, way back uh, probably in around 2000. Uh, taking samples from uh, building structures in Istanbul to test whether uh, what the strength was, whether buildings were capable of strengthening and, uh, and uh, greater resilience and so on. So all uh, very, very important work to share with the world. Now, planning for recovery, uh, this is harder and it's easy to be wise after the event. But there is a growing appreciation of the need, not just for preparedness so that the worst doesn't happen, but also to think through and anticipate uh, when there is a major event, what the recovery process uh, should be. 
and there is an international recovery uh, platform which has been established as part of this HIOGO International Framework for Disaster uh, Risk uh, Reduction. And we are working uh, in this area around guidelines, training packages, capacity building, uh, etc. In, in a number of countries. Uh, some of the key messages coming out of this work is that obviously the recovery, the medium and long term recovery, is a very difficult phase of disaster response and doesn't Christchurch know it. Expectations are high, people want things to go back to some kind of uh, normal state as soon as they can. So the more we learn from what's happened and think ahead and anticipate you know, what the processes need to be for the, for the future, because disasters will strike again, our country and others, uh, you know, the better prepared we can uh, be. Uh, when I think about uh, what we've built in uh, for uh, recovery in New Zealand, I think back to some of those uh, emergency cash schemes for, for farmers affected by very severe weather events when the income just dried up because of drought uh, or a severe flood or a big Canterbury snows. Uh, I think of the uh, emergency employment schemes, which uh, often help with the uh, removal of, uh, of debris. We, we've found a number of ways of, of coping with some of that uh, kind of phase of, of early recovery. And UNDP works in that area in developing countries too. One of the things we did in Haiti was create a very, very big job scheme. We called it Cash for Work, and we created something over 200,000 short-term jobs, which had the advantage of people working for some income, which then gave them the money to buy something from the local trader and got the local markets working again and the economy started to function. We did the same in Mongolia when there was the exceptionally heavy winter called a zood, which uh, wiped out a lot of the pastoralists, uh, uh, animals and took away their they're, they're living. We've, we've done it in Pakistan with recovery from the floods. So, you know, th there are international examples of these kind of social protection schemes uh, that work. Uh, it is very important to get broad participation in the way in which uh, decisions around uh, recovery are framed, and to see that people who have been affected do get that longer term emotional and psychosocial support because major disasters, as we all appreciate, leave a lot of scars on us as, as people. So when the emergency phase ends, people's needs certainly haven't ended. I understand my old friend uh, Peter Beck, now city councillor, has said, and I quote, the wisdom of the local community always exceeds the knowledge of the experts. Well, there's a lot of truth in that and engaging with local communities is about drawing on their knowledge and their expertise and you know, I think participatory decision making is extremely important. Now let me end with a, a few comments on where the international policy framework on this is going. The Hyogo campaign, Hyogo decade actually ends in uh, 2015. So the discussion is starting now on well, what would a next decade look like? What needs to be prioritised in the international disaster risk uh, reduction agenda? And to just to make some points about that, uh, HIOGO has been a voluntary non-binding arrangement. It's set standards, it's done guidelines, uh, etc. It's had very high uptake from governments uh, right uh, around the world and more than 100 countries and territories are actually monitoring and reporting on how they are implementing the HIOGO framework on disaster risk reduction. So I think it's quite important that after 2015 uh, that uh, continues. The framework did not set specific targets uh, and one issue is whether the next decade that follows should have measurable outcomes and targets. Uh, I think that would make the whole thing rather, rather more effective. So that's something to think on. There's also the issue of how to get greater convergence between the disaster risk reduction agenda and other agendas, like the adaptation to climate change uh, agenda, 
like what happens after 2015 with the Millennium Development Goals? Will there be sustainable development goals? How do we refer to disaster risk uh, reduction uh, in, in these uh, processes as well? And sometimes the disaster risk reduction community works almost in isolation from people doing very similar things under different labels. I was quite struck when I was in Bangladesh in late 2010 and my UNDP country director said to me, oh, we're having a lot of trouble sort of getting into the climate change adaptation work in Bangladesh. I said, what on earth are you on about? I said, we've done all this work in Bangladesh on reducing the risk of disaster from flooding, which of course is going to be exacerbated by uh, climate change and rising sea levels and more erratic weather. He said, but that's disaster risk reduction. I said, I don't care what you call it. <laughs> It is about adapting to erratic climate. So we've got to get some, some convergence between the people who are working in these silos on very, uh, very similar, uh, similar fields. Uh, the truth is that with this rising exposure uh, to risk, uh, we do need to scale up investment in building uh, resilience. So the debate around how this Hyogo decade and framework is renewed is, is going to be a good opportunity to put the focus on that. We need really to be stressing whole of government approaches. We know in New Zealand we wouldn't have the level of disaster preparedness we have if we dumped it all on civil defence. No, we've got to have you know, building codes, uh, planning, finance, health sector, emergency services, just you know, right across government people have to be involved and disaster risk preparedness. And I think still in a lot of countries which haven't got good systems is the tendency to think we'll set up a national disaster risk reduction body and dump it on them. Well, that's not going to work. It does need whole of uh, government approaches. We need to be thinking in developing countries about uh, what uh, the very high rate of urbanisation means uh, for uh, dis exposure to disaster. Uh, as of 2008, and for the very first time in human history, more people are living in urban areas than in rural areas, and by 2030 that will be the case in every developing region, including in uh, Africa, and this adds new and different dimensions to disaster risk, so that has to be taken into account. And a final element of mention is that Current thinking is leading to seeing sustainable recovery from disasters as, yes, a human right. The post hiogo framework negotiations uh, will certainly uh, discuss that. Uh, there will be a need for much greater emphasis to be put on recovery, as I've discussed, uh, and put in place arrangements which are human rights based and support inclusive and sustainable post-disaster recovery. As I've said, we need to link into the post-2015 uh, Millennium Development Goal Agenda, what happens next. Very helpfully, in the Rio Plus 20 UN Conference on Sustainable Development held in June, there is explicit mention in the outcome document agreed by all the countries of disaster reduction as an essential ingredient of sustainable development. So disaster reduction is really starting to get this greater uh, prominence now. Um, for UNDP, I mean, we uh, are planning to uh, double the level of support we give for building resilience to disaster over the next uh, five uh, years. Uh, we are going to uh, be working to try to add every year another five countries who we can say really are champions of building better resilience. We have our examples of Mozambique, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Nepal, Ghana, and others have experiences to share, but we need more, many more countries uh, with these good stories uh, to tell. So, in conclusion, no question you know, over the past century, we have seen a lot of progress in human development, but ever greater numbers of people and their assets and their infrastructure are exposed to natural hazards. The risk of losses from these disasters is higher than ever before. 
and the events of recent years convincingly demonstrate what the consequences are of failing to reduce those risks. It's really been a nightmare from the time of the Boxing Day tsunami. It's been one thing after another, droughts, floods, quakes, uh, and these really quite horrific losses of life and the economic losses too. Now, the risk can be modelled, it can be analysed, there's enough knowledge to manage it if the investments are made and the right strategies and policies and measures are put in place. We cannot just dump responsibility for disaster risk management with disaster managers alone. It is a concern for everyone, from the citizen who must be empowered to make decisions which reduce risk, to political leaders, government institutions, the private sector, the civil society organisations, the scientific and technical people, and the professional bodies, and our engineers are among our most precious assets in this regard. Whole of society approaches to disaster risk reduction are going to become more and more important, particularly as climate change alters the hazard patterns. But let us be proud of the role that New Zealand can play in sharing this incredible knowledge and innovation and experience that we have, not only with communities in our own country, but with communities facing the sort of risks that we face right around the world. Thank you.